Welcome to SoFlo by Lucas Millar. <laughs> Lucas's latest collection of 13 short stories, ranging from the gross and silly to heart wrenching thrillers of cosmic proportions. Join Lucas as he takes you beyond the beaches and shows you the dark side of the Sunshine State. Welcome to SoFlo, a collection of weird Florida horror by Lucas Millar. Available January 14th, 2024. Brought to you by the Evil Cookie Publishing. Welcome to another episode of Deadhead Space. I'm your host, Patrick R. McDonough, joined always by my friend, Brennan LaFaro. Say hello, Brennan. Hello, everybody. And our other friend, Candace Nola. Say hello, Candace. Hello, Candace. Today, we are talking to the author of The Haunting of Velk. Oh, damn it. There okay. we go. Yay. Today, we are talking to the author of The Haunting of Velkwood. That is Gwendolyn Kais. Say hello, Gwendolyn. Thank you so much for having me. Yay. Absolutely. Hello. And last time we had you on, the first time I think we had you on was uh, a pretty much a year ago, a little over a year ago, uh, August yeah. 2022. Oh, wait. That was way longer, wasn't it? Uh, that was for Reluctant yeah, yeah. Immortals. And... I still think about that book, the blending of two very infamous oh. characters, seriously. And then you come out with this book, which we'll get to soon. But um, I can't raise it. I keep forgetting. Uh, it, it's it's wonderful. Um, I'll save all the praise for when we actually dive into it a little bit. Spoiler free. Um, so what have you been up to since then? Since August of 2022, the last time you came on, which was the Reluctant Immortals. Uh, yes. Promotion. You know, mostly short fiction, short nonfiction, things like that. You know, I'm at this place now with promoting this book that everybody's like, what's next? And I'm like, I'd love to know. Because like, I, I love writing novels. I love writing novellas. But it's like my big love has always been short fiction. And that's what I've just been doing for really the last year and a half. And now I'm at a place that I'm like, I really need like, everybody else always has at least one full length book out a year, right? Like, I'm not that person. I'm the person I'm gonna have like a lot of short stories or like nonfiction articles but it's like it'll probably be two years before I have another book out so if anybody's a big fan I'm sorry if you're not a big fan I don't know why you're watching this but just rest assured it'll probably be a couple years before there's another full-length book so hopefully a novella I am writing a novella right now and a novel and I'm excited about both of them so that's good so hopefully that'll go somewhere so that's been like you know but it is interesting. I always love when people are like, I have three books coming out in the next three months. And I'm like, I'm just sitting over here writing my short stories. <laughs> I think you, uh, you're you alluring to, uh, alluding to, that's the wrong word, alluding to uh, Stephen Graham Jones, who comes out with three books a day. Just I know. I am not <laughs> subtweeting Stephen Graham Jones. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I'm not subtweeting him. anybody, but I would never do that to Stephen. Oh my gosh. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm kidding. He, he's amazing. But, uh, Candace or Brennan, would either one of you like to jump in? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, we missed you since August because yep. you just bring such a pop to this show and, you know, so much energy. Absolutely love it. Um, now, last time you were on, we had, uh, I had gushed about your collection. I loved your collection. And with, you know, short fiction being your love, we're kind of jumping to that. What are you working on? Because you started covering it. Um, are you thinking about another batch of, of, of stories collected? I would really love that. Yes. That's really, really something that I, I really would like to do at some point because that book came out, I think in 2017. So we're talking seven years ago was my first collection and that's my only collection so far. So yeah, if anything, like maybe a collection at some point in the next year or two, because I feel like those don't have as long of a lead time. I feel like with novels and even novellas, it can be a couple years. Like if you're going through the whole promotion cycle and if you self-publish, maybe not. I don't, the self-publishing can take a long time too so it's like but the short fiction you know that's all most of that would already be written so that's always nice but yeah I love short story collections like that's the Stoker Ballot just came out today congrats to everyone who's on it amazing but you know I always get right down to fiction collection because I'm always like Ooh, who got nominated with short stories because like I just love I just love short fiction so hopefully 
Yeah, I definitely, I feel like I have enough short stories now to probably do two or three collections at this point. Cause like the first collection was very early in my career and now it's been years with a lot of short stories in between. So a lot to sift through to try to figure that out. But yes, hopefully is the answer, hopefully. <laughs> Well, I, I'm going to I'm going to cruelly put you on the spot with the with the caveat that obviously this is not set in stone. But with that idea that you have, you know, you you are a short story producer and you have seven years uh, worth of material. <laughs> if you were to compile a collection, what you know, how would you go about it? Or maybe just what's one way you might approach you know, boiling it down? Yeah, that's something that like I kind of. I kind of keep going back and forth with, you know, I feel like three years ago I had put together which stories I would put maybe, maybe do, but now it's like, I have other ones. So like maybe thematically, you know, maybe, you know, ones that have different points of view. I don't want to, like, I have a lot of second person. I don't want it to be a whole collection of second person. So trying to balance that. So that would be something, you know, I've, I've had some stories that I've been very, very proud of. And I, I always feel bad because then if you say that one, but not another one, I always feel like I'm insulting an editor somewhere. But, you know, like I even just last year, I was very excited about some of the stories. I'm like, oh, I feel like I really hit a good stride. So it's like probably some of the ones that came out like last year, I was very proud of. And yeah, so just things like that and just kind of whatever clicks for me. I'm like that one, that one. And sometimes also it's nice if there was a story, you know, and I think a lot of authors have this happen that. Maybe it didn't get, maybe that uh, publication just didn't get out there. And so this is like an yeah. opportunity. It's like a second, it's just like a second chance for it. And that's always exciting because I had that happen with the first collection that there were some stories that like, I remember, you know, I think one or two that I'd even sent out for publication, but came back as rejections. And then when I, they, they were in the collection, people were like that one, I love that one. Or one that, you know, had been published and didn't really go anywhere and people would single that one out. So it's always nice. Collections give those short stories like a second chance, like go little short stories. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I, I love that idea. Um, Cause you know, everyone has those stories that, you know, went to an anthology and you, you you feel very proud of it. You feel good mm -hmm. about it, and mm -hmm. you know it just it never gained the audience that maybe you felt like it deserved. But yeah. frankly, it sounds like your answer is the theme or makeup of the collection will depend on whatever month it gets greenlit. <laughs> right. I feel like that's true. I feel like that. I feel like that's true with a lot of my career, though. Sometimes people ask, and it's like I have no method to the madness. It's just madness over here. It's just like this is how I'm feeling today. This is the direction we're going. I always love when people ask my process. I'm like, I don't know, chaos. Like, you know, <laughs> there's not a lot of direction for it. <laughs> Just real quick on on uh, short stories, and then we'll move on with Candace. Uh, Ellen Datlow, you know, we we all adore her. She's amazing, greatest anthologist, right? You know, living anthologist right now. But um, it's she was saying that she feels that the best way to tell a horror story is through short story through a short form, and I mm -hmm. tend to agree with it. Although I love novels, I love collections. I you just. <laughs> It's really hard to argue that if you write, if, if there's a compelling enough story where it's a true gut punch, how are you going to, how are you going to stretch that out for a few hundred words or whatever it is? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a dream. Yeah. You know? I think, yeah. I think short stories for horror are just so unique. And I think because mm. like, I often think with horror, we go back to ghost stories. We go back to campfire ghost or stories. Most of his telling is, you know, ghost stories. short stories. Yes. Yes, exactly. And I just think that with horror in particular, it's such a genre for short fiction. So mm. I feel like that's just a very natural fit for it. Agreed. Yeah. Can Miss Candace. Hi. Hey. Hello. So while we're speaking about short stories, and someone did just mention a Stoker uh, list came out today. What about American? In cannibal and your story in there you want to talk about congratulations. that congratulations yeah that's that is on that, that those congratulations i'll go to rebecca so yeah. she's one nominated yeah. in anthology was amazing she's job wonderful she's such a she is so talented and such a great person so it's like mm. so wonderful all the way around so that yeah. i'm so excited for her i think it might be her first stoker nomination too i'm not sure on that but i think it might be i think so 
I think so. Yeah. And so, yeah, so that is The Hungry Wives of Bleak Street is my story in American Cannibal. And so, yeah, that's honestly one of my favorites from last year. So, like, that was one of the ones I didn't want to name outright because I'm like, I don't want to have to pick favorites. But I'm very proud of that story. <laughs> I think a lot of what I'm proud of is just also being in that anthology. It's such a great table of contents. It's such an interesting idea. And I'd never written a cannibal story before, so I was so excited. I'm like, I can't wait to, like, figure out what I'm going to do with this. And so mine is like set in the 1950s. And it's like this group of seemingly perfect housewives who, in order to, you know, appease their families, are slowly cutting off pieces of themselves to feed to their families. And this is just this ritual. They're always expected to do this until like some of the housewives are starting to be like, is this the only way? And that's when things kind of start getting, you know, getting going in the in the horror. <laughs> I love that story so much because it it tickled me pink and I just thought like I'm chubby okay. I'd be fucked. Say that again like you froze. I think I froze for a that's second. That's fine. I'll cut that part out cuz Candace just pretty much uh gave me a cue that that's uh not funny. <laughs> that's not, I'm going to cut that part out. <laughs> now I'm curious what I missed. <laughs> oh man. Okay. I just say stupid shit all the time. I, know, I get self-conscious yeah. and Brendan usually just lets me talk and Candace is the one that pulls the leash back. So, you know, that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. What I said was I really did like that. I love the whole anthology. Uh, Rebecca crushed it. And then you got Candace's Baker's dozen. And then this year, dark disasters. It's like, just to throw this out there for someone that might be new, because we have a lot of new listeners uh, nowadays. If you're asking what good women write, like what good women stories are out there in the horror field, like Gwendolyn, Candace, Rebecca, um, there's just a whole slew of them for examples. But with your story, I said I really loved it. It reminded me of Stepford Wives, and I thought mm. if. I was in that I would be terrified hiding and fucked because I'm a little chubby. So I would be probably caught real quick. Cause I don't know if I'm that fast either. <laughs> you can laugh at that. That's funny. I, I mean, it's self-deprecation, but it's, it's meant to be comedy. It's not, it's sad. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Get us go. <laughs> be I, that. I don't like that. that it, makes was me sad. it was good. It was so good. Patrick. He'd be the first one eaten. I okay. would be. Well, in speed. I feel like I feel like it would be your knack to hide behind an irregularly shaped object that did not hide you at all. <laughs> like a light like bulb. A cartoon. Yeah, exactly. That's fair. What Patrick over there behind the clothesline. Behind a lamp. <laughs> Shade on the head. There is no, no idea. question at this point. There is no question. Uh, so. Yeah. <laughs> Let us steer if nobody has any objections to the haunting of Velkwood. Yes. Absolutely. All right. Now, Gwendolyn, our favorite thing to do on the show is let you tell the synopsis so that we don't butcher it. But uh, while you're doing that, I am so curious about the you know titular neighborhood um, because it just it Velkwood just has this classic gothic ring to it, and I wonder if that was a reference, if that was a word that popped in your head, or where that came from. You know, I, the title of the novel is obviously a play on The Haunting of Hill House. And so Velkwood is kind of a play on like Mary Cat Blackwood and the Blackwood family. And so mm. that was, you know, kind of what I was sort of pulling at. But the word just sort of came to me. And then I'm like, I wonder if I heard this somewhere. But I looked it up and I couldn't really find any equivalent for it. And I'm like, OK, I guess this is my word, which is kind of cool. Like, I don't think there's a Velkwood out there until now. So at least that's like a a unique part of the title, which is kind of funny. I mostly just call it Velkwood at this point. Like, you know, like it, it, it is the haunting of Velkwood, but sometimes I'll just call it Velkwood because that's the kind of the most recognizable part of the title. So, okay, I'll give the synopsis. Although I love it that you're like, oh, you guys might butcher it. Nobody will butcher a synopsis of my book as badly as I will. I always am like, ah, uh, I don't know. I wrote it, but I don't know. Like, what, whatever. Okay, so... It is about <laughs> Velkwood Street, sometimes called the Velkwood vicinity, and it is this neighborhood that has turned into a ghost. It has been a ghost for about 20 years when we come into the story, and the only people who escaped it, who didn't become ghosts that were part of this neighborhood, were these three girls who left for college the night before it turned into a ghost, and now one of them, Talitha Velkwood, is going back and is going to try to sort of settle the score with these ghosts and you know, try to figure out, you know, unravel the mystery of it all. 
That wasn't too that was bad. Good. I'm pretty, I'm pretty yeah. good with that. That was all right. Yeah, was I, I should just like take that recording and like every time somebody asks, just play it. That that's it. That that was the best one. I will literally cut that and give you the MP3. And there you go. Camera. And I'll just play it. <laughs> Do you want me to? <laughs> Here you go. No, no. It's good for me to have to keep doing it. It's okay. good. <laughs> that's how we learn. I, who who goes first? Because I kind of I, super I, I kind of just want to jump in here because. Yeah. I, I hope I'm not giving anything away because you just kind of said what I want to get into. So you said the town is a ghost. The neighborhood, but yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> Where did you get the concept of doing it that way? Because I loved it. Like, I thought it was one of the most original things I had ever read when it comes to a ghost story. Normally, it's one. It's an entity. It's a person. It's, you know. But you made it the neighborhood itself. And the way all of that unfolds, like, how did, where did that concept come from? How, like... Just talk about that, because I thought that part of it was just that is what made it such a unique story from the jump. It wasn't just a person. It was this whole other thing that I don't think has ever been done before. You know, that was something else I looked up. I'm like, I assumed somebody had done this when I came up with the idea, but I never found anything. There's, there, I, I'm still thinking there might be something out there somewhere. But like, you know, there's ghost towns. There are ghost towns, right? right? Like Silent Hill or something right. like that. Because a few people have brought that up. I, I saw. I've never played the game. I saw the movie many years ago, I believe. But like, people have brought that up. So there are ghost towns, and then, like you said, a person can be haunted or a house. One of the things that really, like, how I sort of came to this idea was I always write period pieces. Like, all of my novels mm -hmm. up until this one were set in another era. So the Russ Mains was mostly 1980 and then a little bit 2008. My second novel, Bone Set in Feathers, was like a fairy tale. So it was like, you know, long ago time. Mm -hmm. And then Reluctant Immortals was 1967, California. And I said to myself, like, no, you are not writing another period piece. You're not doing this. You need to write in modern day. This is this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But then I kept wanting to write a period piece. I kept being like, oh, you know, it'd be really cool if I wrote like in the 1970s or something. Yeah. And so I got like this book uh, called Suburbia and it's this photography book um, and it's 1970s Suburbia. And I got it because uh, I'm a big fan of The Virgin Suicides by Sofia Coppola. I like the book too, but I like the movie better. Mm -hmm. And she used this as part of like her mood board for the movie and okay. this, this photography book. And then I found out it also inspired the neighborhood in Edward Scissorhands. And then later I found out it inspired Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So this book has been like around. It's inspired a lot of different things. And I'm looking at this book and I'm like, I'd love to write about a neighborhood like this, like this kind of older neighborhood, you know, that's got all these split levels and all this stuff. And I'm like, but you can't write a period piece, Gwendolyn. You cannot do that. And I'm like, what if just the neighborhood is a ghost and stuck in the past? Like, I like that. Like, that. that's what I'll do. But the rest of the book is in modern day. So it was like I kind of had it both ways. I really wanted to write a period piece, but I'm like, I wasn't allowing myself. But then I just put the neighborhood in the past. So that was really honestly, I think, how I came to this. I'm sure there were other things in my head at the time. You know how as writers, there's always like a million things happening. But that really was kind of like the crux of of it all of like this photography book and I found some other photography books as well I think there was one by a photographer called William Eggleston that was also really neat and had a lot of kind of cool strange suburbia because I think suburbia mm. is very weird I grew up in a small town not necessarily suburbia but yeah. I've always found like kind of the way that David Lynch does suburbia is really interesting because like Twin Peaks and Blue Velvet are very creepy I think suburbia is scary I think everywhere is scary I think everything's gothic <laughs> but I definitely think suburbia is very gothic so that was fun to be able to kind of do that kind of suburban gothic so so you found a loophole in a way to break your own rule <laughs> a rule I set no one said that for me I could have done another period piece no one cared but me but I'm like no I'm not doing it I'm not doing it and the two books I'm working on now are modern day so I I managed to move myself very carefully you know through to modern day stories now 
<laughs> well, I thought it worked well. Like it, it, it worked well and it gave you something just so completely unique for a haunting story. I, I don't know. I think you mailed it. it it's, it's, it's not your normal ghost story. It's not your typical haunting. And anyone who picks this up and thinks it is, I hope you're prepared because it is not like anything you read. I thought it was great. Brennan, you got a question? All right, and keep going. Uh, I, I kind of want to piggyback off what you said. Um, now, first off, when... Gwendolyn, when you said, you know, that Velkwood popped into your mind and you Googled it and no results. I mean, is there any better feeling as a writer when then when you come up with a cool name or something and you Google and it's just it's free and clear, it's you. Um, the and I, and I agree with Candace, there's just you sit and you think and there's just not anything quite like this. You think of, you know, The Shining and its haunted hotel. Uh, there's houses, there's people, but there's there's not this and the um the one thing that it reminded me of a little bit was jeff vandermeer's annihilation where you have this mm -hmm. like area um and the fact that you kind of brought in this kind of like ets government control uh to it uh <laughs> fantastic stuff and so no question there but where i want to go with this is you are clearly a big fan of the haunted house as you know an element in horror why is that such a successful long-running important trope in horror because i love it too it's my favorite place to go so what's your what's your obsession with it you know i feel like ghosts can mean anything i feel like they're such a potent metaphor they they can you know be our nostalgia and something that we want to have back or people we want to have back they can also this is how i tend to use them they're often trauma they're often grief they're often something bad that's literally made into something that you can see right in front of you and so for me i think that that's that's what it is i think so many of us are linked to the past right like i think that the, whether we want to be or not sometimes there's things you know in the past that we're happy you know happy memories but there's also a lot of bad for a lot of people and so ghosts to me represent the past and they can represent the mm -hmm. good parts of it or the bad parts of it and so that i know that's why i love it so much plus it's just a neat concept it's scary it's scary the thought of something that can be very intangible that can be difficult to get away from and so that's just such a such a cool thing plus they're very primal right i always say i feel like horror almost kind of started with ghost stories and kind of started with campfire stories or stories told near fireplaces. And I think ghost stories were some of those earliest ones. So they feel like, you know, that history is so long in, in horror. So it's like, we're kind of paying, you know, homage to that history. Now, when you're writing ghosts, you know, whether it's specifically in The Haunting of Velkwood or in any other piece you're doing, what kind of considerations do you like to make to kind of balance that? Because you're right, it's it's the, these are classic campfire stories. This is arguably one of the oldest horror tropes. Um, what do you use to or, or consider to to balance that kind of classicism and bring it into the modern age and give readers something new to latch on to? You know, and I think, isn't that what we're all trying to do, right? I feel like we're all trying to like, you know, kind of have it strike that balance because a lot of us come to horror because we do love so much of the past of horror, but then you don't want to just do the same thing that's been done. So again, trying to look at it and say kind of two things. One, what hasn't been done? What haven't I seen that I would be entertained by? And then the other thing of like, what haunts me? And that's something I often think with ghost stories is like, what is what what haunts me in general? What's haunted me for a long time or what's just haunting me at this moment? And kind of going from there and building a story out from that idea. So either one of those. And honestly, with this book, I think I really did both. It was like, OK, I've never really seen a haunted neighborhood. So that was one kind of entry into it. And then the other was like, OK, you know, I'm I'm. I hear my husband because like you guys are all going to get to you guys are all going to get to see it. I'm on antibiotics. This is perfect. Like in my my um, alarm just went off. So I hear my husband like in the background, like trying to very quietly tell me. 
take your antibiotics. Everybody gets to see me taking my antibiotics. You know? I think it's that, obvious, that's what but happens to writers, exclusive. right? You get to sit right in the middle of your book tour. <laughs> I think it's obvious, but you can just nod your head because you're drinking. Do you want me to cut this part? I don't care. That's completely up to you. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll cut it. Back to haunted houses. Back to haunted houses. So, yeah. So with this, it really was kind of both parts of of having this haunted neighborhood and that that I hadn't seen done, but then also saying what is haunting me specifically, and you know my own past traumas, let's say, you know, and having those out there, you know, in you know incorporating that into the story. So I feel like that was kind of both parts of of writing this was kind of how I approached that. Yeah, and that that it's that that what is haunting me question is so interesting because it. You know, the, the, you, you always say that there's only so many stories to tell, but every writer with their own unique voice and with their own unique experience can bring that to the story and therefore create something unique. And the question of what is haunting me mm-hmm. is, you know, a universal one that is always going to be evolving just because of the different factors that are happening in society and life, technological advances, uh, what have you. Um, but that leads me into, you know, in the acknowledgments, you had written this may be one of your more personal, if not your most personal novel. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, a, a big part of this, we haven't really talked about it yet here. And some people, some reviewers don't want to talk about it sometimes because they feel like it's a spoiler, but I'm, I don't mind. There is a queer relationship at the center of this story. And a lot of the story is about, you know, the main character dealing with her sexuality. And because she wasn't accepted when she was young, and that was unfortunately something that is very autobiographical. And with writing this, like, so... I, I think I've talked about this, but I'm not sure I have talked about this yet. I was working on a different book initially for the second book in my book deal with Saga Press. And I was about a third of the way through and my husband got sick. He's fine now, but he did have to have surgery. And it kind of derailed this book because like emotionally, I was no longer invested in this book that I had been writing because our lives kind of went into this upheaval. And so I ended up writing Velkwood. I started a whole nother novel. I I ended up having to ask for a deadline extension. I'm not proud of that, but it was just life happens sometimes, right? And I started writing this book. And I didn't know at first what I was writing. I knew I was writing this haunted neighborhood, but I was like, okay, I'm just going to kind of write from where I'm feeling right now. And I was about a third, about a quarter to a third of the way through when I'm like, oh, this is me dealing with my sexuality. I didn't realize that's what this entire book was going to be about. And at that point, it was too late for me to stop because if I would have realized that that was what I was doing, I've been like, oh, this book's going to get shelved because I don't want to have to deal with this at all. This is something I want to put over there. But because I'd already asked for the deadline extension, I couldn't back out. I had to keep going. So the only reason the book got written is because like I was already late on a deadline. So like it ultimately worked out. Like, you know, I ended up being like, okay, I can talk publicly about my sexuality. It's I'm not, nothing terrible is going to happen despite what I was told growing up. And so kind of going from there and like, you know, and it's a happy ending. Like I, I, I ended up winning the, I have my little Lambda right here. This is my little Lambda award for Reluctant Immortals for bisexual fiction. And so it was like very publicly, like I'm winning awards for, for not, for, for, for being queer. Right. So it was like, I love this. I'm actually turning a little red talking about this. I'm still like a little bashful about <laughs> Stoker Con last year, I led I led up like a bisexuality and horror panel. So you'd think I'd be used to talking about it now, but I still get a little like weirded out because it's like all of that uh, childhood trauma, right? All of those ghosts that haunt us, right? So yeah, so that was a big part of why this was so personal to me and having to finally deal with this in a very public way. And so it was like, okay, I guess I'm going to do this now. It was good for me. Like I said, I feel like it was a very cleansing experience of being able to embrace who I am and not be like hiding it anymore. Like I felt like I had to, but it was, it was a very intense experience. And as I was saying beforehand, I don't speak to some family members now because of like writing this book and realizing I really can't do that anymore. But yeah, so it's a, it's been a, it's been an adventure with this book. I remember saying like to my husband beforehand, you know, before it even came out, I'm like, this book has done so much for my personal life already and changed so much. Whatever happens with it once it comes out, like this has been like a big, 
a big shift in, you know, how I approach things and even like both personally and professionally. So, yeah. I love if that's the appropriate word, the idea of almost being, you know, forced to kind of confront mm -hmm. uncomfortable things because yes. of, you know, I, I mean, related, but the deadline's unrelated, you know, like you're working through this, mm -hmm. you know, experience uh, because you have to meet a book deadline. And yeah, no, I just, I think that's very interesting. And, you know, I still think my subconscious did it to me on purpose. Like, I think somewhere my mind knew, like, you need to deal with this and you're on a deadline and you ask for an extension and you're not going to ask for another one because you're horrified you had to ask for one. And so it's like, I think somewhere in my mind was like, oh, we're going to do this now. You're not going to get away now. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> that was going to be my very next statement was <laughs> you were meant to write this one when you wrote it. Like, Absolutely. it was time. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it definitely was. <laughs> I, I just want to echo Brennan's thoughts. Uh, I, I'm we all three of us love you as a person, as a writer. Makes me happy. Aww. Well, we talked to you. We we loved you before we had John. That's why have, that's why we have most guests on. Um, I say most because I was a guest too. So, mm -mm. but <laughs> no, I didn't get a laugh from either one of them. Damn it! But anyways, in all seriousness, <laughs> as you know, I'm not in the LGBTQ community, but as someone I want to speak because we always talk about how, you know, straight white guys should be able to accept everyone. I, I agree with that, but maybe this will help someone because um, you never know. Uh, I have, it's obvious, but I, I've got severe ADHD and maybe there's other stuff. Not sure yet. So I won't say, but um, I could relate. I'm 35 and the show has been going on for almost four years, less than that time. And up until 32, 33, I was ashamed. I thought I was a fucking idiot. Uh, I didn't read throughout mm -hmm. high school except for very like two books because I didn't think I was smart enough. Uh, I just thought that I was broken. Um, and all this to say that I can relate to you in that aspect, the shame of who you are. And no matter what group you're in, like I couldn't relate to most guys. I couldn't relate to the nerds, the the jocks. I played sports. I love nerdy stuff. Because until you exercise those demons like you did, you're not going to be happy and you're never going to relate to anyone. So for that, I say you're you're brave and you did it beautifully. It's oh, a good book. You. Yeah. And the twists you have in it, which I won't spoil. Holy shit. Like I, I do a lot of uh, text to, to voice. Um, I don't know. I just struggle with reading physical books lately. So that's why I do that. But um, I rewound it a lot. And I do that with like books that I'm like, how the fuck did they do that? Like as a writer, I'm like, how the fuck did you thread these words this way? I want to be that good one day. And that rhymes. Um, the, the, there's this really big twist with the um, kids. And I'll just put it at that. Uh, I love seeing Candace smile. Um, I just you had me on one journey and then I'm like, I'm pretty sure Gwendolyn's doing three different stories in one intertwining. And it's like, you know, vines where they're just, it's one main route, but you got three choices. They all end the same, same destination, but Oh my God, lady, what the hell? How are you this good at writing? But the other thing that I really did appreciate was, um, right. The best writers, they don't have to write they don't have to spoon feed you and that's what you did really well and i was going to actually bring up how it was um uh, a queer couple and i i thought of one of my first best friends and and uh i won't go into those details because it's not the point of the story but it just made me happy and smile and then at the same because you were like i like reading that stuff well it's different than what you you, you know you were raised with or at least us. 90s 80s kids were raised with and uh and then it made me really sad because i'm like i know a lot of the stories and i don't like them where they're just like their parents just they're like cut it out stop being yourself so i thought this yeah it's a haunting story it's a ghost story i thought ultimately it's a love story at the core in so many ways it's a plutonic love story it's a it's a it, i can't even say it's romeo and juliet because like the 
it's like more depressing than that story, man. <laughs> <laughs> in the beginning, anyways, and and I say that in the best of ways because for me as a reader, I want to be able to feel for my characters and. Good God, you did that a lot. All right, I am fanboying, and some may say. Okay, so I'm going to jump in. Yeah, because I know where he's going with that, and I have a couple of things that I want to add on to that. The first of which, hopefully, this makes sense, and I don't want to give away the ending, but, (laughs) but. (laughs) Can you speak to a little bit of? how it felt to write that ending Mm. what had to take place Mm -hmm. you know what i mean i think so yeah are you saying the climax or the last chapter which would or the whole thing um the, the the climax in the neighborhood itself okay yeah i'm trying to think of how to talk about it without giving away too much i mean I I feel like a lot of climaxes you could say this about. So very cathartic. And I think catharsis was a big thing for me of how can I kind of exercise my own demons, but also these characters specifically, because, you know, we I think we often as writers can project a lot of our emotions onto our characters. I think that's how you get some of the most powerful writing. I, I mm. found that because a lot of my like my maybe my stories that haven't resonated with readers as much. It's because I wasn't on the page as much. I have found that oftentimes when you bring that kind of stuff to your very personal, you know, moments to something, it does resonate more. You know, I think that that I was thinking what what how can these characters express this in a way that feels authentic to them and what they're going through, but how can it also help me kind of move forward in, in my own way with Mm -hmm. everything, you know, with my own past, with my own ghosts. So that was really a big, a big part of it. So catharsis was, was a big, was a big word. So you you gave the characters the closure that they needed. Did you find your own? I did not as soon as I finished writing it. I wanted to mm-hmm. more, but it's been a longer journey than that. But at this yeah. point, yes, I very much feel like that. I yeah. I actually also feel that part of the reason I haven't written another book and finished one was because I needed to process writing this one. That's why I'm like, short fiction has always been very safe for me. I always feel very safe. No matter what it is, you're in, you're out. You, you're not spending as long there. You can yeah. still get very involved in it, but you're not taking that much time. And I feel like after writing this book, I finished this book in July of 2022. And so mm-hmm. it's been close to two years and it's like, you know, I needed to take some time. And I, sometimes I don't feel like as authors were given that time. It's like, come on, produce another one. But I'm like, I need it. I went through a lot writing this and I had to take a lot of time just to process what that meant to me. And so, yeah. yes, I do feel like I got that closure. It, it it was a long time coming, but I do feel like that. So thank you for asking. <laughs> I'm glad. My second question that Patrick was rambling his way towards like a freight train about to derail. <laughs> Accurate. Um, the love story aspect. Not as depressing as Romeo and Juliet, as Patrick so eloquently put. Um, okay, in the childhood it was. <laughs> not childhood version was depressing. No, no, no she called you eloquent. Was, Just let it happen. Oh, thank you. I'm shutting up now. We done? Boys? Okay. So, sometimes they need a leash. <laughs> Always. Anyway. The love story aspect of it was perfection, in my opinion. Was it ideal? No. Mm. Was it relatable? Absolutely. This was something that carried them through from a very young age, something they both knew and were denied again and again and again whether by parents, by society, by acceptance, by right and wrong or social norms, all of that fed into this in their lives their entire life. Mm -hmm. The way you ended it was absolutely the only way you could have. Mm -hmm. But the love story woven into the story, the pain of it, the trauma of it, the need, the desperation, the anguish, 
that they both felt and the way you portrayed that and then the way everything unfolded as it went, I thought was beautifully written and just perfect for our life and times now. Mm. You don't always meet the one when you're supposed to. Your love story doesn't always end the way you think it's going to end, nor does it start the way you think it's going to start. And I think this one was perfect. In spite of all of the obstacles, in spite of the trauma, in spite of everything, life brought them back around to where they were meant to be all along. And I loved that. I thought that was great. So. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. Thank you so much. <laughs> you know, I think that's what Patrick was trying to get to, but just, you know, couldn't. <laughs> I'm a better writer than I am a speaker. What? So, yes, that's why. Because I've about. seen your text messages. <laughs> It was the first draft, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> you never share those, Candace. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Can I jump in real quick, or are you guys? Yes. All right, this no. one's awesome. Okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen for this. You'll see why in a minute. Do -do -do -do. And if you're only listening to this, you're not going to see this. So I guess you should go to the <laughs> channel. We can uh, tell them what it is. Yeah, we can. We will. Can you guys Aww. see that? Okay, so I'll load them. All right, so that, there George. Is. George Ranson. Everyone Yay. loves him. He's amazing. There he is. Yeah. So he said, Hi, George. He said a few things. I've got a question. Can you please ask Gwendolyn how she got to be so damn awesome? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a real, you know, question. You can answer uh, it if you want. Uh, I, I by, by knowing cool people like George, that's why. There that's totally why. I and then it's George because he's not on any other social media. So now that I'm off Twitter, yeah. Oh. Um, he mentioned wait. that. Wait, he no, said that he thread. misses you. I miss him too. Is he? Yeah, he's on. He's on Threads now, and oh. I only know that because he followed okay. me. I think he's on Instagram. He would have to be right. He seems confused. Is he I on Instagram? Confused. I need to find him if he's on I'm Instagram. Confused because you have to have Threads to have if you if you have Instagram. Yeah, that's. Thought... Yeah. yeah, you have to have both. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, and, let's ask him later. Wait, wait, there was another one. He says, uh, um, she was so great to be around, and I own and have read every one of her books, including the limited chat book, The Invention of Ghosts, which I haven't read yet, and now I'm jealous. And he said she's an amazing writer. So that's it. Oh, well, thank you. George is fantastic. He is. He's, he's, he's the like, nicest guy. Yeah. He's like the writer that I mean, the reader that every writer needs to have as a fan. Totally, totally. Brenner can. We all need a George. Yeah. We all need a George. Well, right now we all need a George. So I want someone listening to make everybody a George. Now I don't know how you're gonna accomplish that, but go down need a to hang a mess. It's a bobblehead doll now. <laughs> we need a George to bobblehead. Hold, holding a Paul Tremblay book, it has to be that because he is the biggest fan of Tremblay. Uh, he sure is. Yeah. All right. Well, Brennan, do you have another question or do you want me to go back in? Uh, you know, following my rambles on haunted house stuff, because I know you're such a big fan. Um, I would love to hear some contemporary and classic favorites in the genre. Ooh. I mean, I already said The Haunting of Hill House. I feel like that's mm -hmm. a good one. We already mentioned The Shining. I feel like that's a, that's another great one. Um, I love the old 40s movie, The Uninvited. It's such a very classic ghost story. Like, this is not like a big bells and whistles, you know, ghost story. But it's got to feel almost like Jane Eyre or Dragon Wick. It's very gothic. And it's fun. It's fun. It's creepy. It's very well made. I love that one. So I always like to bring up that one. You know, what other ones do I love? Like, I feel like I, I, I know there are so many. AC Wise writes so much great ghost stories. Like, I think she, you know, one of her collections was pretty much all ghost stories. So anything by her, it's just, they're always so good. Trying when we're talking of... about ghost stories, I would love to know if you like this. I am obsessed with a few older ones, Rosemary's Baby, but Burn Offerings by Robert Morasco. Uh, I think that's how you say his last name. Um, what, what was that one? 
burnt offerings by I'm pretty sure it's oh, burnt Robert offerings. Or... Okay, you cut off. Oh yeah. I love oh, burnt offerings. Bad. I should have thought of that one. Like I haven't read the book actually. I've only seen the movie, but I love the movie. The movie is like pretty campy, so, but so yeah. much fun. I just so the, adore it. The pool scene is just as if not just as uh fucked up in the book, but the book is the movie's good, but uh I like the book a little I need bit to better. Read the book. You should. Yeah. We should I, all, I imagine. Yeah, I need to. Need we to should that. all read the book and do a do an episode on it. I'm just saying. No one else is for that. Okay, next. Moving on. I didn't hear you. <laughs> Are you guys waiting for me? And you're not going to repeat yourself. Okay. Oh, okay. No, uh, I didn't know if I should. Uh, I said we should all read the book. And do a deep dive on it or something like that because we ain't being oh, okay. that for uh, okay. another show, but I miss it. Yeah. That's it. All right, Candace, you may take over. Oh, okay. <laughs> I no, I insist. You insist. I insist. Back on me. Oh, well. I've asked the questions I wanted to ask about the story itself, but have we missed anything that you wanted to touch on or speak on before we get into maybe a couple other questions? No, I feel like we covered a lot. I actually feel like we covered some things I hadn't gotten a chance to talk about yet. So that's always exciting. That's always fun. That way, if somebody's like listening to several different podcasts with me, it's like, oh, no, here she goes again, talking about the same thing. So thank you. Thank you for kind of leading me down different roads. That's good. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. So I'll go into one that I always like to ask, usually. Um, this is a general question about your writing career itself. So can you talk about one or two of your most memorable experiences as a writer so far and a little bit about why they meant what they meant to you at the time? Ooh, memorable experiences. Mm -hmm. Probably the first one is when I was approached by Jess Landry for my first collection because it was my first book and like, you know, I... I had, I, I, people had asked, were you going to put together a collection? And I'm like, I don't know. I just, I want to write the right opportunity to come along. And I remember somebody being like, what if it just doesn't come along? And I'm like, yeah, I know. Right. Like it might not be the best way of doing things. And then one day, like just, you know, messages me, she was with journal stone at the time and was like, if you would like to put together a collection, if you're working on something, I'd love, I'd love to, you know, look at one. And I'm like, yeah, sure. And so I quickly put together a collection. Like it was like, give me a couple weeks. And, you know, I put together the collection. I even wrote like, I think another story for it or another story or two. Like I could, I wrote fast back then. I'm a slow writer now. Back then I could like write really fast. And so I remember, I think I wrote two stories just in that two weeks to send to her that ended up in, in the final book. And so that one was really a big deal because it was my first book and Jess Landry is incredible. I, I adore mm -hmm. her. I, have worked with her since. She was my editor on The Rust Maidens as well. She's edited a couple short stories um, of mine in anthology. I hope to work with her again. She blurbed Haunting of Velkwood. And so yeah. she's just amazing. She's a filmmaker as well. She's just incredible at everything. So that was just great in general. And then I'm going to actually say, I already showed you guys my Lambda Literary Award, but, you know, winning that was a big deal. Like I said, winning all the Stokers is a big deal as well. I don't want to sound, you know, that that wasn't a huge thing as well. But with with my history of, you know, having a long time coming with being able to come out and yeah. then, you know, winning at the Lambda Literary Awards, which is all about queer literature, was like a really big moment because the, the ceremony last year was in New York City. It was in Times Square. Mm. You know, I went. It was a big dress up event. Um uh, you know, so it was a really big, it was a really big deal. So that was something that it's like going from, you know, being in the closet for so long to being like, okay, I'm bisexual. This is out there for everybody to see. That was like the one thing I can never take away from Twitter because that was the first place I put it out there totally publicly because that mm -hmm. was where I had the largest following and it was so public. And I'm like, once I do this, I can't take this back. And so like, I always like, I will always like, you know, tip my hat to Twitter in that regard for kind of giving that big platform that I'm like, okay, I'm just going to do this. And then I'm going to log off and kind of run away for, for a few <laughs> hours. <laughs> and 
pretend I didn't just do that. So to have that kind of, you know, evolution from from that point to to being in Times Square and winning a literary award for bisexual fiction was like, this is a pretty big thing. This is a pretty big like movement forward. So yeah, so those two things. Nice. And to follow those, what would, I don't want to word this. It's two parter. So one would be, what would you tell a new author who is suffering from rejections and imposter syndrome and insecurities and all of that? What would you tell them to encourage them? And on the flip side of that, what was the most useful advice that somebody ever told you? I actually think it would probably be the same thing. This is what I always okay. kind of fall back on because I feel like this is what I've gotten the most mileage out of as a writer is write the story you want to exist in the world that doesn't. You know, write the thing that will really just light you up, the story you want to read. Because every time I go back to that, if I'm, you know, getting writer's block or getting frustrated, I'm like, what do I want to read? What is what is a story out there that hasn't been written that I just want to read? And so that's mm -hmm. like the advice that I, I, you know, would like to give somebody or, you know, I mentor sometimes. So that is like, write the thing that you really believe in that you want to exist in the world i feel like that's the best advice i've ever heard yeah same <laughs> it's, and i've heard that so many times but it's true like mm -hmm. i think it comes out more more naturally when you're writing the story you want to write that you want to tell that you're immersed in Mm -hmm. rather than trying to pull something into existence that maybe doesn't want to be pulled yet. You know, yes. some stories take more time than others do. And I think the best we can do is write the one that feels the most natural at the time we're writing it. Something we would want to write, something that is not out there and something we want told. Mm -hmm. Those are the easiest ones, I think, to write. Mm -hmm. That's just me. Like, I, and that's how I write as well. Like I write things that I can get lost in that have not been told yet. Things that I would want to sit down and read. And I don't know, case in point, shameless plug, if I may, but I just wrote a totally insane story this last week. And one, it's not something I would normally write. Two, it's for one of my kids. Three, halfway through the story, it begins rhyming. And I left it alone because when I get into a particular zone, my natural tendency as a poet comes out and I start writing in verse. My daughter thought it was hilarious. Aww. And we left it alone and I released it. It's out today. It's on Godless. But... <laughs> I know some people are going to be like, what is going on with this? And I'm like, but it wasn't for you. It was for my daughter. She loved it. It was for her. I loved it when I was writing it. And I just left, I left it. Sometimes you have to write what you're having fun with. Yeah. Not every single story has to be the most important one, the most important message, the most important socially relevant. Sometimes you just want to write a fun story. And that's okay. I think that's also great advice because I've also heard be like, well, always write your best. And I'm like, what if you're going to write something that like, you know, isn't your best, but you're really excited about it. Like trying to constantly talk to yourself, like, how are you ever going to do that? That sounds terrible. Sometimes you yeah. can just write something that you're like, this is really good. And I'm really proud of this. Is it the best thing I've ever written? Maybe just not, but that doesn't mean it doesn't deserve to exist. And then exactly. and also what your assessment of what your best work is, isn't necessarily somebody else's anyways. Exactly. So it's like, you might be like, oh, this isn't my best. And somebody else is like, I, I love that. That's my favorite thing you've ever done. So what do you, right. do? you don't always know what everybody else is going to like anyways. But exactly. I think that's fantastic advice. Like, you know, have fun with it and, and write something. that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. There's always going to be a person who's going to enjoy it. There's always going to be somebody who wants to read that story, who loves that story, that enjoys it. Yes. We all have weird senses of style and entertainment and senses of humor. I mean, sometimes you have to. 
The yeah. story I wrote last night is not going to be for everybody. You know, it's not. But there's some people out there that are like, this is insane. That's who it's for. All right. You know, I just, I, I think if we're not having fun at this, at times, at least part of the time, what are we doing it for? I agree. I agree. You know? So, well, those were my questions. Brendan, I know you have one left in there, at least. At least. Uh, all right. I, I want to talk about process. And I know you said your process is chaos. So I'm going to just, I'm going to give you something specific. Um, when, when I read a Gwendolyn Keist book, um, the prose always jumps out at me. The story is, you know, that I, I've absolutely loved every book I've read, but there's something about your prose that just, you know, it belongs to you within a paragraph of reading it. And what it reminds me of um, my musician brain is uh, playing violin, the, the legato bow strokes, you pull, you, you pull the bow, you know, slow flowing, um, and then when you hit the end of the bow, you have to turn it and move it the other way. And the ideal, you know, behind that is to keep the music, you know, overlapping without any kind of break. But there's always like a little breath in there. And to me, that's that's what I what I hear when I read your stuff is it flows. And there's that, you know, the comma is the little breath before it just goes right back in and continues flowing. So my question for you is. How much of that comes naturally and how much comes in editing? Oh, that's a good question. I, I think it is a combination. And I think the best parts of it probably come out in editing. But there are times that I'll be like, oh, I can keep that whole paragraph. And I'm so excited that, you know, that there are times even from the first draft that certain things work. And a lot of times I can tell when I was having a lot of fun or having a really good writing day because that's the stuff that needs the least amount of editing. I'm like, OK, I can keep all of this. This is all working. But yeah, I mean, a lot of it happens in editing, you know, the stuff that, you know, really making sure to clean it up and kind of get that flow to it. And I always say, I always say to my husband, I'm like, I, I know when it's working and I know when it's not. And sometimes I don't know what the difference is, but I know when there's a difference. And there'll be times, that, you know, he might read something. He's like, it's great. And I'm like, it's not there yet. And I don't know what it's missing, but, you know, going back and continuing editing. And I always have to remind myself that the, I do think a lot of the real magic in writing happens in editing, that that first draft can just be yeah. like very much a blueprint. Like, okay, I know the structure of it now, but now I got to go back and really, you know, revise it to get it to to really flow the way I want it to. Now, at this point in your career, when you're having a day where it's just, and we've all had them, where it's you're looking at what you wrote, you're like, this is not clicking. Do you kind of trust the future editing process and push through, or do you force yourself to walk away sometimes? Both. It depends on the story and it depends on deadlines, right? Like if you've got time, like, okay, I can walk away. But like, you know, if you're on deadline, it's like, I'm, I'm always better under deadline. Like I'm, I'm like, okay, I have to do this. And it forces me to sit down. You know, when I don't have a deadline, I'm like, ah, oh, I'll come back to it. I'm sure I'll be better tomorrow. And maybe tomorrow I'm not even going to work <laughs> on it. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I mean, a lot of times it's best for me to just work through it because that keeps me going and kind of keeps the momentum going. But definitely there are times, you know, I, I just am like, okay, I'm going to walk away, going to gonna give this some space. But I do like to work through it if I can, you know, at least to a point, like if I'm writing a short story, at least to get a draft done or at least to get a one full edit done, even if I know I have to edit it again. Or if I'm working on something longer, at least get a chapter done. Try to get to a place where I feel like I have something that's almost like a complete thing, even if it's not finished. Like, okay, I've got a unit of something. <laughs> I've got a short story. I've got a chapter, something like that, because then I at least feel like, okay, I've, I've done something productive today. Yeah. And I, and I do, I appreciate that you rely on the editing phase. You know, it's, it's, you, you read something like this and, you know, every once in a while we'll get somebody on here who's like, Oh, you know, I barely have to edit that comes out the first try. And it's, I'm just scratching their name off a list. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Um, I, I, there's an earnestness to it though. I, I think that we have to accept that sunshine is not going to, shine out of our butts all of the time you know occasionally we will get <laughs> haphazard material that we have to learn to you know 
cobble into something worthwhile and latch on to the fact that we've done it before and we can do it again. That's one of the biggest things. I don't, I sometimes wonder like how the first few short stories I wrote that I was proud of happened because once they happened, then I'm like, I've done this. I can do this. It was almost like these accidental things. That's what it feels like sometimes because once I could do it, once I knew I'm like, here's a short story. Like I often think of my short story, the cloth but Requiem because it was one of my, I think it was my first one that ever got accepted for semi-pro payment. It got accepted with like Christina Meester and John Bowden and Damien Angelica Wolf. Walters and Lamplight, which I had really always admired. And I was really proud of that story. But I look back and I'm like, I don't know how that story happened. But that was a story I would often use after that of like, I wrote that story, and I'm really proud of it. So I know I can do it again. But like, how did that story happen? I don't know. Like, it just it was like a just this random mystical thing. And sometimes it feels like and that way I could always go back, like you said, then you can always be like, I know I've done this. This can be done again. I can replicate this. But yeah, how it ever happens the first time is like a magical thing to me. <laughs> Absolutely. I Patrick, just wanted to, go ahead. Yeah. So I reached out to Rebecca, told her how much we're raising her because we all love her too. And uh, so many awesome people that right and I, don't know, I just love that we can hear so many cool stories but she did say Gwendolyn is a fucking rock star that show is going to be awesome so coolio to that and they both said pretty much everything else that i wanted to say about the book um i forgot to mention the poetic aspect of your writing i probably said that we probably covered that last time i don't remember but in case i didn't yeah you, you got a beautiful poetic way about you um I think this is where we're going to wrap up and say, what are you currently reading, Gwendolyn? Oh, what am I currently reading? I am actually, I'm, I'm actually, I'm never, I don't know that I've ever read it. I am reading The Secret Diary of Laura Palmer because I'm actually doing, it's Twin Peaks Day on Saturday mm. and I'm going, like I'm doing a virtual book club. Like I'm, I'm joined a virtual book club for this month to read the secret diary of laura palmer so that that is actually what i'm reading right now like i've i've never i don't think i've ever read it before i'm a big twin peaks fan but that's that's it's, it it's like an old book obviously i think it came out in like the 90s right mm -hmm. but yeah <laughs> pretty cool candace i was on mute yeah <laughs> I'm reading a horror movie by paul tremblay nice. working my way through the arc just got done reading Incidents Around the House by Josh Malaman. That's a great one. Creepily yeah. fantastic. <laughs> Brennan. 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 Um, I am, oh, I'm reading an early version of Song of the Tyrant Worm by uh, Haley Piper. It's the third and final book in her uh, The Worm and His Kings trilogy. Uh, and it is trippy as hell um what i what i love about what she's done with those books is i mean anybody who read the first one you read those last few pages you said well how the hell are there going to be more of these and she's gone about it in such an interesting you know way approaching approaching continuation of this i don't want to say story but like world through unexpected viewpoints and and this is no different you know she's She's killing it. I loved that first book so much, and it's been such a privilege to read the other two. Uh, the other thing I am reading, and I got to show this cover because it's awesome, is No One is Safe uh, by Philip Fricasse. And um, it's his his other two story collections from Leith Press. Uh, you know, he he has this really excellent prose, too, and this, you know, depth and heart heartfelt emotional storytelling. And you know, not to say that's not present in this one, but it's very intentionally pulpy. Um, I mean, again, you look at that, and there's th th there's a blob yeah. with like skeletons floating around in it. <laughs> Looks like the it's, blob. It's from Twilight the 50s. Zone. <laughs> yeah, it's Twilight Zone meets like fifties B movies, uh, and it's a lot of fun. Patrick, yourself? Um, yeah, so I'm I'm reading uh, an early copy of Brennan's The Denizens, which I've been excited to read ever since he pitched it to me like three years ago, and. That's way early, so I'm not even going to say what it's about. It's just uh, I always felt like it would be my favorite thing that Brennan's ever written thus far, and it, it's turning out that way so far. But 
A book that I just finished reading, and I know Candace did too, is by Jill Girardi and Lydia Prime. It's called We're Not Ourselves Today. Um, the best way I can put it is that it's like a wide spectrum of women writers and what they face. And I was super honored and uh happy to blurb it and i did compare it to this is absolutely coincidental but it would be awesome if i did this on purpose um i related it to jane austen her writing style um just how she tackles social commentary how she has comedy how she writes about women's dependence and in this it just showed a lot of wide ar array of of that and uh I would only say you switch out the Austin human characters for many supernatural characters. It's, it's fun. Um, it, some are really deep and it's, it's good horror in the sense where like on the surface you can enjoy it, but if you dig a little deeper, you're like, that's really sad. And it kind of reflects on society. Why the fuck are we living like this? So that was my take. I thought it was great. I'm sure Candace would say the same thing. Candace, jump in if you want about that. If not, we can move on to the next part. All right. Uh, um, we're... Wow. Okay. Oh, I thought, I thought that was you had exactly you just... one half second. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. I jumped the gun. I'm sorry. Oh, wow. that trigger fast. <laughs> That's why I was like, move on, idiot. <laughs> I'm really beating myself up tonight. I'm sorry. You, you you got some problems this evening. Um, I think maybe you need some ice cream. I know I do. Yeah, I know I do too. Yeah, right. We should get some. You're too far oh. away. You're eight hours away. From <laughs> I can get some with Gwendolyn though in like a week and a half. Oh, it's I'm true. Literally, I think there's a Cold Stone Creamery. Oh, what the like, right down the street from Riverstone. We should get ice, ice cream. cream after my launch party. We're now I'm ice really cream. excited. Brennan, road trip, okay. you and me. We're going for ice cream. Come get me. <laughs> yeah, drive up to Massachusetts to go to Pittsburgh. Yeah, that makes sense. 16 hour drive. Exactly. Oh my God. I mean, it does make sense. Sometimes the things you do for friends make the best yeah. stories five years down the road. Well, I I want to meet Gwendolyn in person eventually, and I would love to we see you. We never met in person. I always feel like we have because we've done these Zooms, and I feel yeah, like I know yeah. people like in person once I've done a Zoom. <laughs> Same. Same. Oh, That's why um, we do the video. Yeah. Patrick, before you wrap up all the way, Gwendolyn, why don't you go ahead and remind everybody of your event coming up? When, where, how, why? Call. Yeah. Ah, yeah. So my launch party for the haunting of Velkwood is on Tuesday, March 5th at Riverstone Books in Squirrel Hill, which is in Pittsburgh. And that is the same day as the Haunting of Elkwood comes out. So March 5th, we are right now like less than two weeks away. So I'm very excited. Yeah, that's Pretty really good. close. Yeah. Um, okay. Where can people follow you, uh, Gwendolyn? Yeah, I, I am on Facebook and on Instagram. You can look me up under my name, Gwendolyn Keist. And I also have my website, GwendolynKeist.com, and a blog that I still use because I love blogs. So <laughs> you can find me at all those places. I like chat forms too. I miss them. I don't know if it's ro me romanticizing the 90s, like AIM and all that, but it was fun. I liked it, enjoyed it. Uh, Candace, where can people follow you? Uh, my address is six. No, um, no, don't do that. You mean online? <laughs> oh, yeah. um, Facebook, like TikTok, Instagram, <laughs> Twitter, all over socials under Candace Nola or under Uncomfortably Dark. And my website is also Candace Nola Author or Uncomfortably Dark. One or the other. Right. In. You can follow me on Twitter at PR McDonough. Don't send me inappropriate things. Please don't, because that's mine. Um, you can find you can follow me at Brandon Lafaro or the show at Deadhead Space on pretty much all the platforms. Um, we're gonna do final thoughts. I'm gonna jump in first and just say, "Hey, Gwendolyn loves short stories." We talked about nominations for Stoker. Candice was nominated for a for third year in a row, uh, Splatterpunk, for her uh, anthology Dark Disasters. So, Candice. Uh, uh, plug that. I forgot the word plug. So plug that for one second. Plug what? Dark disasters. 
You gave me a second. Like, oh. I'm not doing that again. Um, what do you want me to say? Dark Disasters is out now. <laughs> there you go. Nailed it. Uh, <laughs> final thoughts, Gwendolyn. God, my brain's farting all over the place. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me on. This was so much fun. Yay. <laughs> Candace. Yeah, I could probably talk to you for like another hour and a half without these two chuckleheads sitting in the background. That's fair. Just saying they're family. <laughs> We're in the it's background now. <laughs> um, no, but thank you for your time this evening. I know you stay incredibly busy. Um, thank you for the book. Yeah. And not just for the lovely copy that I have here, but for writing it. Um, the story was fantastic. The concept was unique and it was needed. So thank you. Thank you. Brennan. Sorry, uh, people should buy this. People will love it. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna harp on because frankly, listening to Candace and Gwendolyn talk about it, like if you if you need more reasons, just rewind and go listen to that again because <laughs> they really hit everything. They hit every reason. Uh, yeah, no, another, another. I, I loved Reluctant Immortals so much, and I got this. I said, "Oh, I it will live up to it." It did. It, it's it, <laughs> you just keep hitting them out of the park. So, thank you for joining us, and we'd love to have you back again. Absolutely, I'd love to. I'd love to come back. So definitely. <laughs> Yeah, just I mean, what else can I say? We we love having you on. Uh, we appreciate that. And uh, I'm just going to reiterate: the haunted of Elkwood is yeah, it's it's, it's queer horror or whatever you want to label it as. It's haunting. It's a love story. You know, whatever suits your fancy. But um, I know that you're writing it from a place of uh, um, being queer. But I I do really think that it will help uh, other people because if I read this when I was younger, uh. I'd feel less lonely as a kid that didn't have a lot of book oh. friends. So I think that's important and worth bringing up because I don't hear, I'm still bashed, you know, shy about talking the ADHD stuff. So for that, seriously, thank you. That, that was, uh, that was, that was really cool to read. So I think you're going to change some lives and I don't say that lightly because books like this do help people in bad times. Um, Next episode is 236. That's with Mark Taos. So looking towards that, as always, you have many choices in podcasts. Thank you for picking us.